I'll begin by asking you, what is Green Revolution according to you? Well, the Green Revolution was a term coined in 1968 to mark the beginning of uh, agricultural progress based on improved yields, productivity improvement. Before that, we were having increased production, but that came from an area expansion, more area under agriculture. From about 1968 onwards, our progress was more towards yield per hectare or per area, and that was caused about by the high yielding varieties of wheat, of rice, of uh, jowar, bajra, maize, and uh, they were all grown with water, irrigation water, and good soil fertility management. The high yielding varieties were capable of converting irrigation water and soil nutrients into grains. This is what we started calling Green Revolution. Originally it was named as Wheat Revolution because the progress first started in wheat, then it got extended to other crops. Now, uh, when you were thinking about this concept, uh, you, since you are considered, considered one of the pioneers, uh, what kind of problems were you facing, say, from the authorities, from the government? Well, when, you know, when, uh, the backdrop to our independence was the Great Bengal Famine, 1942-43, where several million people died. This is why our first Prime Minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, said, everything else, everything else can wait but not agriculture, because it was clear. And Mahatma Gandhi said, God is bread to those who are hungry, and it is the fundamental duty of independent India to see that this God prevails in every home and hut of our country. And so people like me who were brought up in the post-independence area, era, our major aim was how to see that famines like Bengal famine do not recur again. So how do we do it? Only by producing more production within, the, with our own, within our own country. And also our farm size was small, and the more yield you have, the greater is the marketable surplus. In other words, a small farmer's income can go up only if he or she has more marketable surplus. And that again can come only from yield improvement. This is why from the early 50s, we started working on scientific technologies by which the plants can respond more to nutrients, give more water, because inputs are needed for output. Well, I wouldn't say there were ma many major problems in the Green Revolution. Fortunately, there are three ingredients which are necessary for the success of any production program. One is technology economically viable technology, socially acceptable technology, and that was available, both from our own work and also from collaboration with people like Dr. Norman Borlaug in Mexico. Secondly, you require public policies, the political will. That also became available in the mid-60s, thanks to people like Mr. C. Subramanian, who was fortunately then the Minister for Food and Agriculture. He took the right policies in terms of pricing, he developed an Agricultural Prices Commission, a method of marketing, and also National Seeds Corporation to produce seeds and so on. So the package of services, the package of public policies, and the package of technology, they all became mutually reinforcing. And when that happens, the progress is fast. And that's what really happened, leading to Green Revolution within a few years. Now, somewhere along, uh, it is said that the Green Revolution stopped the import of PL480 also. Now, how much uh, do you agree with that? Well, in 1966, we imported 10 million tons of food grains. That is the highest import we had. It was building up to that level from the late 50s, gradually up to 1966, because 1964, 65, there was a severe drought, largely from the PL480 program of the United States of America. By 1971, 72, we built up our own grain reserve of nearly 10 million tons from homegrown food, some imported food. And in fact, from that time onwards, we have made some imports, both concessional imports as well as commercial imports. But those have been very marginal in relation to our requirements because of the policy of the Government of India to build up a large grain reserve, buffer stocks as they are called. At one stage, for example, two or three years ago, we had nearly 30 million tons of food grains in our reserve. Now, how happy are you with the revolution, say, in the 90s? How is it going in the 90s? Well, right now, uh, there is some kind of what we call the fatigue of the Green Revolution. There is a little slowing of the pace. Progress is taking place, but on the other hand, our population is increasing, land is shrinking, more and more good arable land is going out of agriculture for construction, for roads, for industry and so on, and groundwater is going down, uh, unsustainable exploitation. 
So, now we have to see agriculture in terms of more ecological techniques, what we call sustainable agriculture and it is very important that in both in terms of technology and public policy, we now have a new set of public policies, a new set of technologies. And uh, where do land reforms uh, figure in this whole equation? Land reform was one of the planks of uh, independent India, it started with land reform, sealing to land, distribution of the sealing surplus land to those who have no land, security of tenure, we had a whole package of land reform. It has gone good and bad and different, states like Kerala and West Bengal have done extremely well in uh, land reform. Many other states are in various stages, I would say between Kerala and West Bengal and other states there have been various series of uh, Tamil Nadu has done well and so on. And uh, land reform is fundamental because unless the tiller of the soil has long term stake in the land, they will not invest on the land. The infrastructure, infra in, if I do not own this piece of land, why should I make an investment here? I will not make. That is why land reform, owner cultivation, not absentee landlords, like what was prevalent in British days. Fortunately, absentee landlordism has practically, I would not say completely, practically vanished. This has been a very major achievement of independent India. But uh, lack of permanent tenancy, whatever you are talking about, does it cause, uh, is it one of the factors contributing to this uh, shift from uh, of people from rural to urban areas? I would not say that lack of uh, security of tenure is responsible for the rural urban migration. The rural mi urban migration is largely confined to those who have no land at all, like landless labor families, agricultural labor. The loss of rural livelihoods leads them to come in search of jobs to urban areas. I would say it is a symptom of our uh, neglect in terms of investment in rural areas. Even today, people who are well to do, if they make some money in village, they invest it in the town. Mahatma Gandhi identified this disease long ago when he said, unless the drain of brain and funds, resources from the village to the city is stopped, he didn't call the brain drain going abroad, he called it the brain drain from the village to the town, all educated people emigrating from the village. And now what has happened, the rich people and the well to do and the educated have left the village for jobs either in India or abroad and the poor are coming to the cities in urban slums what we call environmental refugees. Environmental refugees is now becoming a very serious problem, the loss of livelihoods in rural areas. This can be done only by a massive investment in rural infrastructure, rural roads, rural markets, rural communication and much more effort in non-farm employment of farm employment, not only farm employment, because there is not enough land. We have to create jobs outside the farm sector in the processing, agro-processing, agri-business, small-scale agri-business and so on. Does the state of the village economy today in India concern you? Very much so. I am very worried about the state of rural economy. The rural India is crying for attention, attention from scientists, attention from policy makers, attention from bankers and investors. The present system of banking, the transaction costs are so high, they are not able to reach the poor, what we call the unreached. This is why today there is a great deal of emphasis on what is called microcredit, small scale credit operated by the people themselves with a revolving fund. So micro level planning, micro enterprises and micro credit are the way to go. And fortunately with our Panchayati Raj, elected Panchayati Raj institutions with one third woman, I think it should be possible now to reverse our development in favor of small scale enterprises supported by very low transaction cost credit, not this huge staff and pay commissions and so on. Now, uh, is the planning process, the five year plans, uh, have they reflected on agricultural yields and gains? Do you think they have done Every well? Every five year plan there is a target for agriculture and by and large we are reaching the target somewhat below 5 million tons, 10 million tons. These have been modest targets, they are not very large targets. What is important now is to look upon agriculture not merely in terms of food production, but in terms of how many jobs it creates, how, many, how much more income it gives to the rural people. So that I would say more jobs, more income and more food should all be there. In the past our whole agricultural strategy was in terms of tonnage, so many million tons of rice, so many ton million tons of wheat and so on. Today you must go into, uh, you must say per litre of water how much we produce of grains or of fruits and vegetables, how many jobs have we created, 
how much more income we have incre increased in the villages. That should be our yardstick, not just a million tons of grains. Because our, uh, our food, uh, our hunger problem in India is not to be measured in million tons of food grains. It has to be measured in million person years of jobs, million person years of livelihoods or income because the purchasing power is not there. The markets are full of fruits and vegetables and, and grains, but people still, 300 million people in this country are undernourished. Now, uh, coming back to the Green Revolution, uh, any uh, personal uh, reminiscences about uh, some anecdotes which you find interesting, which you want to tell people about how it happened, say any procedural... Uh, well, when we started these new technologies in 1960, early 60s, late 50s, Many people felt, you know, our farmers are fatalistic. In fact, foreign authors wrote Paul and William Paddock, Paul Ehrlich. They said Indians will all die out of starvation, die out of starvation in the 70s. And you know, it troubled us very much when you read those books. In the 60s, it was very common. Dire predictions for India. One book said Indians will be going like sheep to slaughterhouse because they will all die. They have no other option, out of hunger and so on. So it hurt us, but on the other hand, hurting. But, and they said the farmers are all fatalistic, they won't go. And we knew that farmers are everywhere the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are, our farmers cannot take risks. They are so poor. And therefore, what we, in 1964, we started what we call a national demonstration program. In order to show to the farmers, and it was always put up in the poorest farmer field in the village. Because anything you show in a rich farmer field, they will say, this chap is very rich. He can do, I cannot do, I am a poor man. But if you do something in the poor man field, then rich can also benefit. The reverse won't happen. Therefore, we put up these demonstrations. The we means they put up, the farmers. We gave some help. And that immediately, you know, when a farmer, poor farmer produced five tons of wheat, where they were only producing one ton, the whole technology spread like wildfire. A small government program became a mass movement. And that was a great accomplishment. Otherwise, the Green Revolution would have never come by any government program. It had to come. Government was a trigger, a catalyst. But it was the farmers who, who made it a movement, a mass movement, the Punjab farmer in particular, the Sikh farmer in particular. Therefore, it was a very exciting period. I recall in 1966, we had a severe drought when we imported 10 million tons of food grain. There was a team from BBC making a film on our, on our drought. And uh, then uh, towards the end of the film, they went to Bihar, they put some pictures and free kitchens and, uh, and so on. They came to me, I was working in the field in the Pusa Institute in Delhi, the Indian Agricultural Research Institute. They say, you, somebody said you are an optimist, what is your feeling? We want to close with your remarks, this film, <laughs> otherwise it's too depressing. I said, I don't know how it happened, but anyway, 1966, it is on record. I said the wheat harvest of 1968 will be a turning point in India's agricultural destiny. By God's grace, by government help, by political support, by farmers' hard work, it came true because in 1968, we increased wheat production by 5 million tons, from 12 million tons to 17 million tons. That was not just, I, I was not an astrologer to make a prediction. It was based upon some calculations. By 68, we would have so much, so much of area under the new varieties and so on. And this should give you so much additional grain. And it came true. I mean, though, so I would say in the 60s, uh, we turned our whole history around agricultural history of India. After all, from Mahanjadaro time, when we started wheat cultivation, in the, in the Mahanjadaro excavations, wheat grain was found. From the Mahanjadaro to 1950, we produced 6 million tons of wheat. In 1950, when the first fire plant started, about 6 million tons of wheat. Today, this, our farmers this year have harvested 68 million tons. So you see, the progress has been phenomenal in many areas. It does not mean there are not problems, there are a number of problems which we'll have to face because every action has many reactions. Some are favorable, some are not favorable. Over-exploitation of natural resources, over-exploitation of the groundwater, excessive use of pesticides, excessive use of fertilizers, all are also now having their impact. And so it is very important that we now look at our strategy very carefully for the next millennium and uh, develop what, as we did in the 50s and 60s, it is now necessary to look at the last 30 years of progress and draw a balance sheet. This is our success, this is our concern, our problem, how to maximize our success, how to eliminate our problems. This is how one must proceed.